was the spring of 1992, and I was on a road trip through Texas with my girlfriend, Jennifer, uh, who's now my wife. And we lived together for two years at this point, and Jennifer decided that it was time for me uh, to see her in the place that had spawned her and formed her, and to meet her father, Bud. Uh, I was raised Owen, but everybody called him Bud. Uh, Bud was a legendary figure in Jennifer's life, and not for good reasons. Um, he had walked out on the family when Jennifer was very young. They'd been estranged for many years, and she, was, she had spent a good part of her adult life trying to figure out if it was possible to negotiate some sort of relationship uh, with him while there was still time. And now there wasn't as much time as there had been previously because he had pancreatic cancer and he was gonna die. It gets funnier. Um, <laughs> So we rolled into Houston, and we arranged to meet Bud and his second wife, Margie. Remember, this being the woman that Bud had walked out on Jennifer's mother for all those years before. Arranged to meet them at a restaurant, neutral ground. Bud and Margie were both raging alcoholics. I told you, it gets funnier, right? <laughs> uh, Bud was clearly sick by this time, so he wasn't drinking. His doctors had convinced him he should give it up. Margie, however, was in perfect health, and she started knocking him back. Boom, boom, boom. About halfway through the dinner, she's hammered, Bud is embarrassed, tensions rise. It was a very tense and testy evening. But we managed to get through it, we survived, said our good nights, went back to the hotel. And we had one more night in Houston, and the next morning at the hotel, much to our surprise, the phone rings, and it's Bud inviting us to dinner again that night, our last night in town. And we couldn't think of any way to get out of it, so we agreed. We go to the second restaurant that he, had, uh, that he had found and walked in, and it was just Bud, no Margie. And Bud explained that Margie wasn't going to be able to make it tonight because she wasn't feeling well. And I remember thinking, yeah, I, I bet. Um, so we sat down at the table, just the three of us now. Me, Jennifer, Bud. And without Margie tilting slowly to the left, through the whole meal to kind of take up the space between them, I watched Bud and Jennifer circle each other like prize fighters, angling for position. Offense, defense, jab, cover up. Again, a very tense and testy evening, with me tap dancing as fast as I could between them to try to keep things light. But there was too much history there, and it was not going to be kept light. But again, we managed to survive the dinner and get out of there alive said our good nights, said our goodbyes, and went back to the hotel. The next morning we got up and we drove to Galveston. We had a wonderful day in Galveston on the beach. And the morning after that, we got up and we decided to drive from Galveston to Amarillo for biscuits. 650 miles, <laughs> 10 and a half hours in the car, because we had read in Texas Monthly that there was a little joint in Amarillo that made the best biscuits in the state. Now, we were on a road trip. That's what you do on road trips, right? So we got in the car. Off we went. The deal that Jennifer and I have always had on road trips and continue to have to this day is that Jennifer does all the driving, and I do everything else. <laughs> and there's, there's more than you might think. Um, <laughs> Jennifer... Uh, Grew up driving, and I did not. Um, she loves to drive, I do not. She's comfortable and confident behind the wheel, and at, at this point, in 1992, I was not, I'd really only been driving for the two years we'd lived in LA. Uh, so I was happy to let her do all the driving while I got music on the radio, made sure we had snacks, um, <laughs> navigated. So I'm, I'm, sort of the, uh, I'm sort of the cruise director on road trips, and Jennifer is the captain. Now, that's always been our deal. It works for us. So we hit the road. We were on the road all day long, and it was well past dark. And I looked across at Jennifer behind the wheel, and I saw her staring down at her left hand on the steering wheel. And I knew right away what was happening. She was in the early stages of a migraine. She was losing the vision in her left eye. And she was trying to focus on her left hand to gauge where she was in the vision loss. She pulled the car over to the side of the road. She said, you have to get us to Amarillo. Okay, super quick primer on migraine. 
Again, let's keep the laughter going. Um, <laughs> migraine is, is incredibly insidious. It's thought to come on as a reaction to stress, but it doesn't come on during the stress, during the, the, the stressful situation or environment. Migraine waits for you to get through it, let down your guard, relax, and then you get walloped. Excruciating headache, extreme nausea, sensitivity to light and heat. It's brutal. We were in a classic migraine trigger window, and there it was. Now, per the terms of our road trip contract, the last thing I wanted to do was get behind the wheel, but by this time, Jennifer was in the passenger seat. She had it cranked all the way back, covering her eyes with her hands. I got behind the wheel, got us back on the road. Pitch black, middle of nowhere, nobody in front of us, nobody behind us. I had no idea how to get to where we were going, no idea where we were. I put the hammer down, 85, 90, 95. I may have hit 100, I don't really know. And then, just like in the movies, I looked in the rearview mirror, and I saw blue flashing lights behind us. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm going to get pulled over in nowhere, Texas. At a minimum, I'm going to get written a huge speeding ticket. At a maximum, this guy's going to take one look in the car, not like the looks of me, not like what he sees. And I'm going straight to jail. <laughs> Never to be heard from again. Jennifer will be fine. She'll meet somebody else. She'll be fine. <laughs> so I pull the car over onto the shoulder, and I wait. And just like in a slightly different movie, the blue flashing lights came up behind us, pulled around us, and burned off down the highway into the blackness ahead. It was not our night to get pulled over in nowhere, Texas. I got the car back on the road, put the hammer down, 85, 90, 95. My knuckles white on the wheel the whole time. And I got us to Amarillo. We pulled into the parking lot of whatever cheap chain motel it was we were staying at. I remember the parking lot was very dark and we could see the lights in the lobby. The lobby was very bright. And for some reason, Jennifer had to come in with me while I got us checked in. I think the reservation was under her name or the, it was on her credit card, but she had to come with me. So she had her sunglasses on at night. She takes my arm, we hobble across the, the parking lot and we walk into the lobby. It's lit up like Times Square. There are two middle-aged women behind the counter. They look at Jennifer, they look at me, back to Jennifer, back to me. And I realize that in the movie that's unspooling in their heads, Jennifer is Tina Turner and I'm Ike. <laughs> they think I beat the crap out of her. So one of the, the desk clerks says to Jennifer with a gesture that's clearly meant to dismiss me, she moves me aside with her arm and says to Jennifer, she said, are you okay, honey? And Jennifer says, I just need to get into our room and go to sleep. <laughs> so I managed to get us checked in. I get Jennifer into the room. She lies down on the bed, fully clothed, pulls the blanket up to her chin with her sunglasses still on. We turn down the lights, turn up the air conditioning all the way. And I go down the hall to find a vending machine and get her a Coke. Because in migraine town, Coke is very important. Um, Coke is loaded with caffeine. The caffeine is a vasodilator. It opens up the blood vessels to your brain, gives you some relief from the headache. You live with somebody who has migraines, you learn this. By the time I got back to the room, it was dark. It was starting to get frigidly cold. Jennifer was laid out on the bed with the blanket pulled up to her chin. I poured the Coke into a plastic cup, left it on the nightstand for her. And I sat down in a chair and watched her until she fell asleep. And I remember thinking, so this is adult romance. This is what you do sometimes for the people you love. You put your fears, your nervousness, your inhibitions aside, break the law, risk going to jail. Also, you can get them to where they need to be. Even if where they need to be is a tiny, unfamiliar room in the cold and the dark. Thank you. Bill Barreau, ladies and gentlemen.